Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the praise and the worship. We thank you for the opportunity once again to gather back together and to be reminded of your goodness in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the freedoms we enjoy in this country. We thank you, Lord, that your power and presence is here tonight. We thank you for the word of God that we will learn and receive from here this evening. Help us, Lord, to have eyes to see and ears to hear everything that you have from your word for us here tonight so that we leave the service stronger in our spirit than when we came in here tonight and better equipped to do everything you ask of us in these last days. We thank you, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' name, everybody that agrees with that said together, amen. amen. All right, back up and park. And let's get into the Word of God. First of all, thank you so much. It's just, I know I speak for my wife when I say it's such a breath of fresh air for us just to be home. We're never here, hardly, but this is, in our hearts, our home church. It has been for a number of years, and it's just a great joy for us to be here. No matter what the circumstances may be that bring us back to the rock, it's a great place for us just to be refreshed and to be blessed and edified and encouraged in the work we're doing overseas. Um, the good news is that this past year has been very productive for us. We just came back from the Philippines about a month ago, and the summer months were very, very fruitful for us. I'll, I'll be happy to share the good news with you. We were able to lead more than 6,500 people to Jesus in the Crusades and the basketball camps and the things that we conducted. So we are very thankful to the Lord that he used us to do such things, as well as over 1,000 people receive their healings in the Crusades we conducted. So God is at work. We have about 150 churches now and a Bible school and uh, an active Crusade ministry. So your prayers and your support help us reach those people. It's based on the island of Mindanao. The Philippines is an island nation and Mindanao is the southernmost of the large major islands and that's where all the Muslims live and that's where all the fighting takes place and all of the uh, uh, conflict. So we are at the edge of it all there, and we're thankful to, to the Lord that he takes good care of us, uh, despite the fact that we travel in and out of hot zones, militarily speaking, and the Lord continues to take good care of us and watch over us. And so we appreciate your prayers for continued safety as well as provision to do what the Lord has asked us to do on that island in that country. Praise the Lord. Time is, in fact, and indeed running out. So... How many have their Bibles or their Bible device, whichever you have brought tonight, electronic or otherwise? I want you to start with me this evening to uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We're going to take a look at a few passages from Acts 4 tonight. And uh, I've been meditating and thinking and being led along the lines of what I'm going to talk with you about tonight just in the past several weeks. And Acts chapter 4 is a chapter that is devoted to the response to the persecution that came against Peter and John for the miracle performed on the man crippled from his birth laid at the, at the gate called Beautiful, which is found in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are going into the temple at the hour of prayer, and there is the, the, the crippled man laid at the gate every day, the Bible says, uh, impotent and unable to stand. And he has his hand out, and he says, you know, he wants something from, the, from, from Peter and John, some money, and he says, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He takes him by the hand. He lifts him up immediately. His feet and his ankle bones receive strength. And he goes into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And the entire temple converges on this, this man. They know who he is. He's been at the gate for who knows how long. They know who he is and they're stunned and shocked that he's running and leaping and praising the Lord. And as a result of this, the apostles are arrested and put into jail. And then the uh, leadership of the uh, Jerusalem church is brought together, and now they're going to interrogate them for what happened with this guy at the gate called Beautiful. So Acts chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, When they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, 
By him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And then verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. You know, every so often people come along and they want to talk to me or really argue with me about the narrow-minded concept of Christianity, according to their thinking. You know, they will come along and say, well, how come you people think you're the only ones? Do you mean to say that, uh, you know, the, the Muslims and the Buddhists and the other uh, organized religions full of really sincere people seeking God just like you, are you, are you going to stand there and tell us that you're the only way, that none of these people have an avenue to God, that it's the Christian way or no way? And the answer, of course, to that question is yes. There is no other way. No other name given among men. No other name given among men whereby a person must be saved. Someone says, well, how come there's no other name under heaven whereby a person must be saved? And the answer is very simple, because nobody else paid for our sins. That's why. Muhammad didn't pay, Buddha didn't pay, Confucius didn't pay, the Pope didn't pay, the New Agers in the prisms and rocks, they didn't pay, Jesus paid. It's his blood on a mercy seat, no one else's. He sits at the right hand of God, nobody else. Nobody else has an avenue to the Father except Jesus, that's it. Like it or leave it, but that's the truth. Be warm, be filled, and be gone if you don't like it because that's your problem, not mine. I'm just here to have a good time telling you the truth. Praise the Lord. So verse, verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Our gospel in this day and age has to be a gospel of power. It cannot simply be a message. It has to be a message that's confirmed with power. If it's not confirmed with power, it's no different than anybody else's message. It's just a different message. It's a philosophy. It's an intellectual acceptance of who God might be, and we hope we're right when we die and find out. But when this man was healed and he stood next to these two who were being interrogated and, and arrested and persecuted for what happened, the enemies of the gospel could say nothing against this because the man was standing there. They could say nothing against it. And this is what we have. This is the message we can share. This is who we represent, the same Jesus who the Bible says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to prove to people that he's the same. He wants to demonstrate to people he's alive and well and wants to do it through the power manifested to confirm the message we share. And I want you to notice that they realize, the Bible says these, these Pharisees and Sadducees, the persecutors, they realize that these people had been with Jesus. Now I want you to know something here tonight. There are a lot of people who are saved by Jesus, but they've never been with Jesus. Jesus. They're saved, they're on their way to heaven, but they've never been with Jesus. My question to you tonight, have you been with Jesus? Because when you are with him, miracles follow you the same way they followed him. And the good news above the good news on top of the good news is that anybody in this room is qualified to be used. You don't have to go to somebody's Bible school to have a bunch of initials tacked on the back of your name. You are qualified if you have hands to lay on the sick, if you have a heart to believe God and trust for the miracles, all things are possible to him who believes, is what the Bible says. To him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. Okay? Notice it says they realized that not only these people had been with Jesus, but that they were uneducated and untrained. In, in the church world, we have this... this, this uh, what I call this Christian caste system, where we place people on relative pedestals of importance or level, relative levels of qualification or validation. You know, and we, we, for the most part, most people tend to put themselves down on a lower level because they don't think they can be used because they don't think they're qualified. But I'm here to tell you that the same Holy Spirit that lives in me or lives in any of the leadership of this church or who lived in Jesus lives in you. 
And if ever we're going to be a people that has a relevant message for the day in which we live, where you can turn on your TV set or, or uh, turn on your computer and upload YouTube and whatever and watch people cutting other people's heads off in the name of religion, this is a time like no other time when they need to see the power of God to confirm the message we share. That's what we need. That's what we have to have. Amen. I've said it for years. One miracle is worth 10,000 sermons. And testimonies build churches. Testimonies build churches. Not fancy programs and all those other things. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's you coming into contact with the power of God that changes your life. And you have a testimony no one can take from you. Nobody can argue with you about it. I've never argued healing with a person who got healed. It's always with the guy that didn't get healed. Okay? The people that got it, they know it's for real. They've experienced it. They have that testimony, see. Look with me at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians in the second chapter. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians, and uh, he says in the second chapter in the first verse, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you, check this out, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Okay, see, Paul was not this deified creature that we make him out to be. My man was used by God to write two-thirds of the New Testament, heavily anointed by God, saw great miracles, and so on and so forth. But he had issues, just like you and I, okay? He, he, he talks about, I'm, I, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Nevertheless, verse 4, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now listen, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You have to ask yourself, where's my faith grounded tonight? Where's my faith rooted tonight? Is it in just someone's fancy preaching? somebody's personality that I just happen to gravitate to? Or is it the power of God? Has something happened in my life that has so gravitated me to Jesus, nothing, nothing in this world can shake me from my decision to follow him for the rest of my life and do all I can to witness in his name? Where's your faith grounded? Where's your faith rooted? It, if it's rooted in the power of God, you are on solid ground. And Jesus said, the storms may come, but because you build your house on the rock your house will stand. You build your house on the sand of somebody's personality or somebody's fancy whatever out there, you're going to fall because if you have to entertain them to get them, you have to entertain them to keep them. And, you know, we're not in the entertainment business. We're not here to entertain people. We're here to tell them the truth about the gospel. There is a heaven and there is a hell, and you're going to go to one or the other. And the power of God is here to confirm the fact that the message I share is valid. And you need to know that. Now, after that, it's between you and God. But my job is to deliver the goods. And I don't have to be educated, and I don't have to go get a doctorate of divinity to be qualified to do this. Peter and John were uneducated and untrained men, and look what God used them to do. Amen. And if God did it for those guys, he can do it for us here tonight. Every single one of us. Amen. So, you know, we need to realize the gospel is not just a gospel with a message, it's a gospel of power. Look with me at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 for just a second with me. Romans 1 and verse 16, okay? This is Paul talking this time to the Roman church. And he says in chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. See, you have to believe for this. Not every Christian believes for this. Okay, I believe that when I preach, people are going to be healed. I believe that when we preach, people are going to be saved. I believe that when we share the good news, things happen to people from the inside out. Notice Paul says, the gospel of Christ is the power of God. The power is in the gospel. And I heard T.L. Osborne, a great man of God, someone that I followed for years, I read all of his books, devoured everything he wrote, 
he's now in heaven, but uh, back in the 80s, you know, he was uh, very active in ministry, and he'd been all over the world in the 60s and 70s doing these gigantic crusades, lots of things like what Reinhard Bonnke does today, and uh, Osborne did it 30 years before. And uh, he, he wrote books on, on missions and stuff, and I just, you know, I devoured all of it. And I had the chance one time to be with him and to just kind of drive him around and be his armor bearer. And I was asking him some questions about his crusades and things. And he made a statement that I never forgot, and I committed the statement to memory. He said, I said, you know, he's talking about all the miracles. You know, they used to pile up the wheelchairs and the crutches and stuff in that man's meetings. And I talked with him about the miracles. How does it happen like that? He said, it's so simple, people miss it. I said, what do you mean people miss it? It's so simple. He said, the power is in the announcement. I never heard anybody say it a bit like that. The power is in the announcement, meaning the power of God is manifested when it's announced, when it's proclaimed. He says, all I do is proclaim it, and then God does the rest. I, I put no pressure on myself. I let God be miraculous because I give him the chance to be great just because I show up and share the message. He said, the message is the power. The power is in the message. If I announce it, the power takes care of itself, and the people who believe it receive it. You know, in the Philippines, we've seen all kinds of wonderful things. I'm thinking of one particular meeting. Uh, we had a crusade, and, and there were lots of people being healed. Thousands of people were in the park, and we're holding this crusade. And a man brought his infant child to the hospital about three or four blocks away, not knowing there's a crusade taking place. The baby was sick, and the baby died in the emergency room of the hospital. And, you know, you can imagine how distraught the father is and the, the medical people are trying to console the poor soul and he's holding his dead infant in his arms. And they said to him, there's nothing more we can do. We're so sorry. But, you know, there's a crusade going on just down the, down the block. Down, down the, a few blocks. There's a, and it's, in fact, it's going on right now. And we've been hearing that people are being healed. Why don't you take your baby over there? There's nothing more we can do for him here. Take the baby over there. So he runs with the child in his arms. Now, we don't know any of this is happening. He runs to the meeting. By the time he gets there, we're already praying for the sick. The, the salvation portion of the message is finished. And uh, you know, he's in the back. There's a big sea of people in front of him. He can't get to the front because of the press. So he's in the back. He's holding his baby up, this little infant. And he's screaming, dead, dead baby, dead baby. My baby's dead. And we could barely hear him, and we couldn't really understand what's going on. Who's this guy, you know? And send somebody out there to find out what's going on, you know? He keeps shouting and screaming. And to make the long story short, you know, because he can't get to the front to let us pray for the child face to face, right with him there, he, said, he, he tells the people, pass the child to the front. So they're passing the infant overhead to the front. We see this baby coming towards us. They're just passing it overhead, you know, one to another, to another, to another, to the front. We see this infant coming towards us, and we don't know what's going on. My wife and I are standing there just kind of watching this happen. Who is this, and what is this, and what's going on here? And he's screaming in the back, dead, dead baby, my baby's dead, you know, do something. And we, the, the, the baby finally got to the front, and we, we, we took the baby. I took the baby in my arms, you know, little infant, a couple months old, and, you know, dead, not breathing, eyes closed, you know, just kind of that bluish look, uh, bluish tint to its face, you know, and he's dead. So we prayed, and right in front of 2,000 people, the baby popped its eyes open, started crying, and the, 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 the skin changed color, and you know, praise the Lord. So we said, well, pass him back. So back he went, you know, do, 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 all the way to the back. Hallelujah. And at, you know, at, and the Lord said, now give an altar call. We had already given one. He said, give another. And all the people that had showed up since the first altar call, every single one of them got saved. Every hand went up in the park. As far as you could see, in all directions, they all shot their hands. I want Jesus. I want that power. I want what, what, what that guy's got. I want that. I want that. Praise the Lord. It's very, in, in this terrible time of world history, which is leading us to the seven-year tribulation, if you think things are rough now around the world, hide and watch for five years. If, it's, if you think it's bad now where you can turn on your set and watch people cutting other people's heads off, it's, that's only the beginning. That's just the birth pangs of where we're going. And, uh, you know, we're, we are on such a downward spiral. If we don't have the power of God to confirm our message, we of all people are just stumbling around out there, you know. It, it's really kind of pathetic. And this is where most Christians are. They love the Lord, but they have no, no basis to found and ground their faith. It's just up here. It's all up here. Okay? 
And, and, you know, no matter what the devil throws my way, I've been down the road before. I've been healed. I've been shot at. We've had all kinds of things happen. I know who my God is, and I know who I serve. And I'm not going anywhere. Amen. They can, they can threaten me all they want, but we're not going anywhere. We'll be around. When the dust settles, we'll be there for Jesus. And that's the kind of mentality we have to have. There is a particular congregation that God stands in the midst of. It's not AG, Foursquare, Church of God, Church of Christ, Church of whatever, Church of who are you. You know, it's, it's, it's a denomination that's spiritual in its origin and spiritual in its definition. It's identified in Psalms 82. Let's look there for just a minute. Psalms 82 and verse 1. People, you know, have small wars fought over their denominational names and uh, their church and, you know, who I represent, you know, and all of this. Well, there's only one congregation God stands in the midst of, and he talks about it here in Psalms 82. And if I'm going to be a person of power, I have to be a member in good standing within this congregation, okay? Psalms 82 and verse 1. Here's what it says. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Notice God's plural, small g. We're not talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. We are talking about God's view of us, how he sees us. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. All right. We're not stupid enough to declare that we're divine of some kind. That would be ridiculous. But Jesus used Psalms 82 when the Jews were questioning him about his miracle ministry in John chapter 10. He quoted Psalms 82. Back to the Jews, he said, if you don't believe my message, look at my miracles. And does it, doesn't it say in your Bible, I said you are gods? And he quoted from this chapter right here, this, this psalm. And Psalms 82 is a psalm that is designed by the Holy Spirit to locate the believer so that you and I know who we are and what we can be in him and what we can do in him. Okay? God stands in the congregation of the mighty. That's the congregation I want to be a member of. That's the congregation I want to join up to. That's the one I want to hang with and be with because that's the one he stands in the midst of. The congregation of the mighty, not the, the Pentecostals or the Evangelicals or all the other labels we put on people and upon churches and move, movements and groups. No, no, no. This one. I want to be a congregational member of the mighty church where my credentials are not what I've learned, but the power that has been manifested to confirm what I've learned and what I've shared. And that's, that's, what, that's what built this church. You know, churches are built with testimonies, miracles, people who have had their lives changed and then go talk to someone else about it and they want their life changed. And so they come along because they know someone who had their life changed. They know they're going through some things and they know how the power of God helped them and they want that same kind of power in their life. Okay. We need, you know, we desperately need, in my opinion, this is just my opinion perhaps, but, you know, we need to move beyond the let's feel better about ourselves messages. Let's move beyond the 10,000-fold return so I can hoard more, have more, save more, just all for me. It's all for me after all. As long as you continue to help me, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. But uh, when you stop serving my needs, I'm feeling led by the Holy Spirit to go somewhere else. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're being led, buddy, but it ain't the Holy Spirit doing the leading. I'm sure you're being led, but it ain't the Holy Spirit leading you, okay? A church that challenges you to stretch and push the envelope as far as you can go. Get so far out on a power limb, you have no way back. There's where you need to be. That's when life becomes exciting, and that's when you begin to see miracles in your life. Not just in the pastor's life, not just in the guy on TV, but your life. Where your life becomes a living miracle, a walking testimony of the power of God in your community, in your neighborhood, at work where you go. Because where you go is where you are. That's not where I am. That's where not where pastors are. That's where you are. Jesus is waiting for you to do something there. Not there. They're not there. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. I want to be a part of that congregation. And God told me to share some things with you. There's two prerequisites for joining this congregation, two. It's basically pretty simple. And I'll share them with you here tonight. Each of these would be a message unto itself, of course, but for time's sake, we'll just touch on these quickly. Two prerequisites for membership in the congregation of the mighty. Number one, sacrifice. Sacrifice. And number two, sanctification. Sacrifice, 
sanctification. If I want to be a member in good standing in the congregation of the mighty, I have to be willing to sacrifice and I have to be sanctified. Okay? Sacrifice deals with an attitude, a, a decision on my part to give up or live without whatever it takes to help the gospel be spread wherever I'm told to spread it. Okay? I'm willing to give up. Anything's on the table. Anything. Everything. Whatever I own is God's, and he can take it anytime he wants. Any amount of money, any personal possessions, uh, starting with my home, if you have one, cars, bank accounts, money, name it. It's on the table. If God wants it, he can have it. Sacrifice. Okay? Listen, God does not meet people at their point of convenience. He meets people at their point of sacrifice. If your gift does not mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything to God. And if it's not a stretch for you, God's not impressed. Okay? And the, the best story that I can think of in the Bible that illustrates that point would be the widow with the two mites in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44 record the story of Jesus in the temple watching people give. And the Bible says he was there watching for quite some time, and, and the Bible says a lot of rich people put a lot of money in. And he never said a word. He never criticized them. He never commended them. He just watched for a long time. But then here comes the widow with the two mites, translated just a few cents. And she takes out the, the, the few mites, she throws it into the treasury, and Jesus says, stop the presses. Stands up and turns to his disciples and says, do you realize what she just did? Well, of course they didn't. So he's going to teach them and tell them. He said, I want you to know that this woman who just put in a couple of cents put in more than all those rich people combined. So it's, ne it's never the amount that impresses God. It's the amount left over that impresses God. It's the level of sacrifice. It's the willingness to get involved at whatever level I'm told to for the sake of the gospel. This is what impresses God, okay? And, you know, when I, when I got on an airplane 34 years ago and flew to the Philippines with $20 in my pocket, and a one-way ticket and no way back to the U.S. You can be sure my knees were knocking all the way across the Pacific on that first flight. I was, you know, I was sweating beads, baby. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking, what have I done? I mean, I, I have committed. I have committed to the fight. I am on the plane and we are going. And I've got 20 bucks and no way back, you know, and there's no one there to meet me. No one's there to gonna, you know, show a little banner, welcome, oh man of God, you know, behold. You know, and I'm not going to get off the plane and say, Dost thou not know us who I ameth? You know, <laughs> boweth before me. You know, they, are you kidding? I mean, I'm hanging on for dear life. You know, hanging on to that seat, you know, and, and when that plane lands, you know, and all the Filipinos are getting all their stuff off the overhead bins, you know, and jabbering in languages. I don't know what they're saying. I don't talk the language, and there's no one to meet me. And I'm looking out the window, and back then there were no jetways. They'd roll the stairs to the side of the jet, you know, and, and we walked down the steps onto the tarmac. And I'm looking out the window, and the stairs are right there, and I'm looking, and there are two guards with Uzi submachine guns at the base of the stairs greeting the passengers by going through all their luggage looking for bombs and guns and weapons and knives. And I'm thinking, man, I am not in Kansas anymore, Toto. You know, what have I done? I mean, if I've missed God, I am in a world of hurt because I, there's no recourse for me. But in that seat, that was the loneliest moment of my life from then until now. And in that seat, God spoke to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, you just relax. You are in the right place at the right time doing what I'm telling you to do. I'll take good care of you. <sighs> Those words. It was just like the fear balloon had someone puncture it with a pin, and all the air was let out. I just thought, oh, my God, I'll make it. I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. You know, because it's easy to roam around declaring your faith when you're not, when you haven't yet committed to the fight. You know, I used to roam around the Bible school. You know, I'm a, I'm a man of God. Watch out, devil. I'm coming through. I'm the new breed. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm going to win souls, kick the devil around, hold crusades, build churches, praise the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. Then I got on the airplane, you know, with 20 bucks and no way back and landed made my way south, you know. I mean, in, in, in Bible school, you can roam around, you know, God's got an army, marching through the land, deliverance is their song, with healing in their hand. Hey. <laughs> then you get on the airplane, you realize where you're going and how far you're away from home. It's like, God's got an army, marching through the land, <laughs> deliverance is their song, with healing in the hand. Hey. The, the, the tone changes, you know. It's not quite as... Uh, majestic as it was back at the camp. 
yeah, I'm going to, that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to win souls, you know. And then I made my way south, you know, made my way south to Mindanao and got down there. And just within two weeks, within two weeks of landing for the first time, I met Ethel for the first time. And I took one look at her and I said, no, that's what I'm talking about right there. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. But see, so many people cheat themselves out of so many blessings because they are unwilling to sacrifice anything of value to them for the work of God in their areas of influence. And they cheat themselves out of so many blessings. You've got to understand, God meets you at your point of sacrifice, and that's where he will meet you and begin to work with you. And if you want to be a member of the congregation, the mighty, be willing to lay it all on the line for the Lord. Don't give him this half-hearted, well, I'm with you, just I'm only with you up to a point. No, it's all, it's all on the table for you, Lord. Whatever you need from me, I'll give it. Whatever you need, it's there for you. You just let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll unhook. I'll let it go. That's number one, sacrifice. Number two, sanctification. It's time for the world. It's, let, me, let me rephrase. It's time for the body of Christ to get the world out of their heads, hearts, and lives. You don't hear a lot of preaching on holiness and purity, but boy, if ever was a time when you needed to hear it, it's now. Jesus is a holy Jesus. We serve a holy God, and a holy spirit lives in us. Holy spirit, not just a spirit. And we need to understand that sanctification is not some old-fashioned, out-of-date, out-of-touch message. Sanctification is a ticket to a world of power that you and I know nothing about beyond our intellect. Okay? When I, I, you know, I want to walk in such power when people, when I walk into a room, people sense there's something there. And I believe for those things, okay? Not that I'm somebody special, but the, the, the Holy Spirit in me is, okay? Whatever Jesus, wherever he went, people, when he walked into a room, people took a step back, man. I mean, they gave him some space. They didn't know him. They didn't know much about him, but he just had an aura about him that commanded respect. And when he opened his mouth, people shut up and they listened, they may not have agreed with it, but they couldn't, they couldn't, you know, I mean, he just commanded the scene. And that's what sanctification does, okay? We need to be people who are separated from the world. We need to be people who are different. We need to be people who think differently, act differently, talk differently than the unbelievers. That doesn't mean we separate from them and build a monastery and check in until Jesus comes. It's talking, we're talking about we blend with people, but we don't lower ourselves to their level. We lift them up to our level and we encourage them to be like we are because they see something's working in our life that isn't working in theirs. And just like what Paul says, I don't apologize for the gospel and I don't apologize for being different, okay? You have to understand that uh, this is where things happen or don't happen for a believer. Look with me at... Um, 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. There's many verses that we're not going to have time to get to, but we'll get to the ones that uh, the Holy Spirit knows we need to read. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, he's writing this to Christians. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, verse 17, is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. See, the world is passing away, everything in it. All these people, you know, when they come out with the new i whatever, iPad, iPhone, i whatever it is, all these things they come out with, people line up for days to buy this stuff. And I'm just, I'm watching this on TV and I'm just shaking my head. What misplaced priorities for people to camp out in front of an Apple store for three, now if you did it, God bless you, and don't throw your phone at me. You know, don't throw your phone at me, I'm just making a point. Just listen for a minute, okay? But I'm, I'm, the, the point is, why do people, why would people do things like that Okay, I would like to see people lined up in front of the church a day before the church service starts. Can't wait to give their offering. Can't wait to give their house. Can't wait to give their car. You know, listen, today's i, whatever it is, iPhone 6, is next year's i junk. 
they'll have iPhone 7, iPhone 8, iPhone 9, 10, 11, 12 until Jesus comes. Okay? It's a treadmill. You get on this thing and you can never get off. You got to have the latest gadget. You got to have the latest, you know, listen, things come, things go. The Bible, the Word of God, spiritual things don't change. Everything in the world changes. Everything grows old and becomes corrupt and wroth, a moth eaten and, and rusted and all of this. Nothing in the spirit world is like that. My priorities, according to Colossians, is to set my, my, my affection on things above. Set my affection on things above, not things on this earth. Things on this earth change all the time. All the time. And we need to be people who are sanctified and have enough presence of mind to realize that, to realize that. Okay? If you understand this, and you're willing to sacrifice and sanctify unto the Lord, then you're going to have to make some, some adjustments and decisions with who your friends are and who you hang with. You have to put them all out, just like Jesus. Look with me in Mark chapter 5. Mark 5, verse 40. Mark 5 is the chapter where Jesus shows up at Jairus' house to lay hands upon his daughter, okay? Mark chapter 5. And uh, he comes, you know, the woman with the issue of blood has already touched the hem of his garment, and she's been healed, and he's had this conversation with her, and he said, go and sin no more and all this, and she's gone. And so they show up at Jairus' house late, but nonetheless, you know, they've already been told that the girl is dead, but Jesus, when he heard this, said, don't, don't be afraid, only believe, and let's keep going. So they show up. And when they got there, everybody's crying and weeping and wailing as we see and as we read, okay? And it says in verse 39, when he came in, he, that's Jesus, he said to them, why do you make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Verse 40, and they ridiculed him. But when he put them all outside, notice, when he put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say unto you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years old. And they were overcome with great amazement. I want you to notice several things in the story. First of all, he put them all out. And if you want to be a person that God can trust in the clutch, you're going to have to put them all out of your life whoever them may be, or the things in your life that hold you back, okay? Paul made a statement in 1 Corinthians 6. He said, we, you are not limited by our preaching. You're limited by your own affections. Meaning to say, it's your affections that you can't let go of the world that is holding you back. It's not us holding you back. You're holding yourself back. Because you won't let go of the world. You, won't look, you want everything. You won't let go of it. It's too important to you. Your priorities are all messed up. Until you get that part of your life straightened out, I can't, we can't help you. And God can't help you. Okay? So he put them all out. He got rid of them. All the complainers and the mockers and the unbelievers, he put them all out. Okay? And he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him. Those who were with him. Who were those with him? Peter, James, John. Those three. Those were the ones with him at that moment. Those who were with him. And they all went into the room, and they all watched Jesus pick the girl up, say, Talitha Kumi, take her by the hand, and they all watched her rise from the dead. All of them in that room that afternoon or that morning, whatever. Okay. He put them all out. Now, fast forward 25 or 30 years. Go to Acts chapter 9. Fast forward now. Jesus has died, gone back to heaven. And the disciples have been commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and they are doing it. And Peter is one of those doing it. And in Acts chapter 9, a very similar situation takes place. Okay? In Acts chapter 9, there was a, a very a committed believer, a woman named Dorcas, who died. And because the people in that town had heard that Peter was nearby in another town, they sent messengers to him to get him back to this place to lay hands on Dorcas, who had already died. Very similar to what Jesus faced in Mark chapter 5. Okay? So it says in verse 38, Acts 9, 38. Let's start there. Since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him 
not to delay in coming to them. Verse 39, then Peter arose and went with them. And when he came, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by weeping and showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Verse 40, but Peter, what did he do? Put them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, where did he learn to do that? Where did he see somebody do that before? He was with Jesus in the room when he did it. And he saw Jesus do it. And years later, he's following the same example he learned from Jesus because he was there when he did it. He put them all out. He got rid of all the unbelief. He got rid of the peripheral people. And you and I, you need, we need to be people who are very selective about who we allow into our inner circle of friendship. You can be friendly with people. You can be friendly and you can pray with people, but those who are going to be people you turn to when your back is up against the wall, those got to be people who are committed or more committed to gospel than you. Which means you're going to have a very short list of friends, real friends, true friends. I've been in the ministry 34 years. I can count on two hands the number of friends that I turn to when the chips are down in my life. Your pastor is one of them. But I'll tell you for a fact, I can be friendly with people. Well, not a lot of people, but some people. <laughs> just, just a few along the way, just trying to keep it going, you know. But the point is, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to bear my soul and my struggles and my frustrations with someone who hasn't bled with me, someone who hasn't cried with me, someone who hasn't been on the front lines with me. You don't know where I'm coming from. Why would I want to talk to you about anything? You know, I want to come to a place where I, I, I put them out and I keep them out. God bless you. You know, I love you, but I can't hang with you anymore. Why? Well, you know, the Bible says to love unlovely people, and you are the unloveliest person I have ever met. So I got to just put you out. I got to move on. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got to have some friends who are going to with, be with me. Praise the Lord. Check out your friends tonight. Who are the people that are close to you and why are they close to you? If you want to be a member of the congregation of the mighty, the one that gets things done, the special forces, the army within the army, then you're going to have to make some choices about who you hang with and why you hang with them. And if they aren't as committed to Jesus as they need to be, you need to love them and dump them and move on and find some new friends. God bless you. Be warm, be filled, and be gone in the name of Jesus. I got to move on. Amen. So, you know, it's really up to you. I made my choice in my life. I'm encouraging you to make yours because we're, we're entering into a season of time in history where, uh, you know, God, the, the evil in the world will continue to increase. On the other hand, there'll be millions of people saved. I want to be on the front lines. I want, where they, I want to be where the action is. For the Lord, guns blazing, bullets flying by, bombs exploding everywhere. But we're out on the front lines doing something for Jesus. And I want to stand before the Lord someday and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. I just, you know, a lot of Christians are going to get to heaven, thank, thankfully for that part. But all they're going to hear, they won't hear well done, they'll hear, well. What happened to you? Where'd you disappear to for 30 years? I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. It's, it's a once around the block. Our life is but a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. I want to make the most of my time, and I've made my choice, and I encourage you to make yours. Amen. Because missions is anybody who doesn't know Jesus. That's missions. Your mission might be across the street. Mine happens to be in the Philippines. Yours is across the street or down the street, whatever. That's missions. Unsaved people are missions, whoever they may be. We're all missionaries. We all have a mission, and we all have a message. But how many of us have the power to confirm it? Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word tonight. We believe this word is sown in good ground. We thank you that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers only. I pray, Lord, everybody in this room will take to heart their life as it presently is 
and if it is not what it needs to be, that they will make the adjustments tonight before they leave. I pray, Lord God, that we will all leave this place with a fresh commitment to sacrifice when necessary and to sanctify our life to whatever degree is necessary to get us back on track or to keep us on track where we presently are so that we will not fall away and become some kind of spiritual statistic, someone who would have, should have, or could have, and never did. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't know who is a member of the church. I don't know who's a visitor. I don't know the condition of your heart here tonight, but God knows exactly where you are and what's going on in your life. Here's the good news. You can't fool God. So you might as well be honest with the condition of your life right now. You know the way you're living your life. You know what's going on. You know what you watch. You know what movies you buy. You know what your priorities are. You know. And God does too. Maybe we don't know, but he does. And you can't fool him. So I'm going to ask you tonight to be honest with the condition of your heart. Okay? People are one breath away from heaven or hell. You understand that? That if you die without Christ, there is no recourse for you. Choice is on this side of death. Once you die, choice is removed from you. The power of choice is taken from you. You can choose now to accept Jesus if you have never accepted him. You can choose now to come back to him if you have wandered away or drifted away. You can choose. You die, you can't choose anymore. The power of choice is removed from you on the other side. Whatever you choose to do in this life seals your destiny on the other side of death. Seals you for eternity. And if you die tonight and you're not ready to meet Jesus, you are lost, my friend. You are lost and there is no hope for you. No hope. You'll never get another chance at Jesus. Everybody in hell, everybody in hell, if they had one more chance to accept Jesus, they'd all accept him. But they can't because they won't get the chance. Their judgment has been set and their eternity is sealed. And that is something to think about. So I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm going to count to three. When I reach three and clap my hands and you hear me do that, you shoot your hands straight in the air and say, I need to get my life right. I know I'm not living right and I want to settle things with God tonight. Tonight, I want to settle things with God tonight. And I want my life to count for something for the rest of my life. I don't need to be just a church person that shows up and occupies a chair and looks around and goes home and blends back in for six days. I want to make a difference in my life for Jesus while I am here. Because I can't go back and redo yesterday. Yesterday's gone. Yesterday's past. You can't change it. But you can do something about tonight, and you can do something about tomorrow. All right? Now, this is a decision. It's not a feeling. Feelings follow. Feelings come, feelings go. This is a decision. When I count to three and I clap my hands, you put your hand up. And don't be ashamed to do so. Don't try to inch it up and hope I don't see. Shoot that hand up and say, it's me. I need help. I need help, and I want it tonight. That's what we're here for. That's what this church is here for. All right? One, two, three. Put your hand up. Thank you. One, two, three, thank you. Four, five, thank you. Six, thank you. Anyone else? Six, I see six. Thank you. Seven, anyone else? Don't be shy about it. If you know it's you, put that hand up and say, it's me. I know what's going on, and I don't want it to go on anymore in my life. Let's all stand. You've been sitting for a little while. Let's seal the deal, spiritually speaking. If you put your hand up, you know why you did. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you to come off of where you're standing right now. Come down to the front and let me congratulate you face to face. All right? While we all rejoice with you. Come on down here. Come on down here. And receive Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Come on down. Amen. God bless you. For the reason that I do. Come on down. Jesus, I Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Come on down. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, I We love the Lord. We love the Lord. We love the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. All right.
right. You guys are the most beautiful thing in all of heaven. All of heaven is doing back, back flips, rejoicing for what's happening in your life right now. And we salute you for your courage to come on down here and recognize I need help and I, and I want to change my life tonight. Praise the Lord. So I want you to go with Pastor Joel right here. Let him explain to you and talk to you for a few minutes, okay? Your friends will wait for you. This won't take but a few minutes. Just go with him for a minute. We'll put some things in your hand, help you understand what's going on, and then you'll be able to get back to your friends and your family, okay? Amen. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.